Hello and welcome to episode 1, week 1 of Magic Connections. My name is Andrew Lee from Malaysia and I am your host. Magic Connection is about sharing the mystery with magicians from all over the world. We hope to inspire one another, discover new talents and create opportunities for magicians to connect from the East to the West. Our guest for the night is known as one of the world's most innovative and exciting magical performers. His shows have won rave reviews and standing ovations in Vegas showrooms, theaters and arenas around the world. He is an author, teacher and the man behind the mask. He is also the founder of the McBride Magic and Mystery School. Please welcome Jeff McBride. Three-time winner at the International Grand Prix of Magic in Monte Carlo, Jeff McBride is known around the world as one of the most original and exciting performers of our time. He holds Guinness World Records in three categories. His show combines drama, sleight of hand, comedy, and dazzling grand illusion. The LA Times calls McBride a showstopper, has to be seen to be believed. McBride's award-winning mask act has taken him around the world as an international television personality. He was the featured judge on the VH1 series Celebra Cadabra. He's a three-time winner of the World Magic Awards and is recognized around the world for his many appearances on Masters of Illusion. Star Trek fans know him as Joran, a role specially created for him on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. He's been a celebrity guest on every major television network and has also been featured in documentaries on PBS and The Learning Channel. Jeff McBride is a dynamic keynote speaker, offering motivational talks to companies and audiences worldwide on creativity and problem solving. He's the founder and creator of the Magic and Mystery School, the world's leading school for professional magicians, where students gather to learn the true secrets from the masters. BBC TV News calls McBride's Magic and Mystery School the most prestigious magic school in the world. From Bali to Burning Man, Jeff McBride's astounded audiences in over 40 countries around the world. Jeff McBride's headlined some of the largest venues and arenas, from Caesars Palace and many top Las Vegas showrooms to Radio City Music Hall in New York. Experience the mask, the magic, and mystery of Jeff McBride. And welcome to Las Vegas, Andrew Lee. This is Jeff McBride coming to you from the Magic and Mystery School in Las Vegas. And it's wonderful to be here with all of your viewers Thank on your you. debut you. show. You are a star. This is great. I understand it's like five o'clock in the morning right now in Las Vegas, Jeff. Yes. Well, yeah, it's 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 I think it's uh, regular uh, party hours in Las Vegas for, for all of the people that are up late at night. See, this is kind of regular show business hours because we work so late in the uh, evening. Some of the shows don't start till like 10, 30, 11 o'clock, get out at midnight. And so this, this is, this is playtime for Las Vegas. It's uh, near, nearly bedtime. So how are things in Vegas? I, I mean, I heard everything is closed at the moment with the casinos and, and stuff like that. Well, they, 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 there was some talk. Some of the hotels are closed for a couple of months. There's some talk of, of some of the hotels opening up in limited capacity. So there's been some news about that. But, uh, you know, the, the spirit here is very positive. People are using this time to upgrade their skills, to upgrade their their online skills like you are. You're taking advantage of this time to, to work on your talk show and to develop an online presence. And uh, people are, are very positive. I spend a lot of time with people like Matt Franco, who is one of our students here at the Magic and Mystery School. And he has a weekly show, Magic Reinvented Weekly. <clears throat> and I did his show. And people are making new connections all over the world. You know, I've been on a lot of different talk shows, doing performances, doing interviews, uh, spending lots of time uh, talking with uh, master 
uh, David Copperfield about some of his visions for the future and some of his thoughts on magic. And I think a lot of people are, are kind of rebooting their career at this time. A lot of people are pivoting into the online space and online shows are happening. Um, I know that the Mystery School has been streaming for the past nine years. Right. Uh, every week so we've been doing this a long we've been doing this a really long time back to you i mean there's also like close-up magic color magic stage magic uh the stand-up magic and now of course there's online magic um what do you think about online shows and i mean do you think they are the real thing now at this time well it's the only thing at this time is online shows and it really depends like on the on the quality of the show at this point there's a lot of you know, a lot of people trying new things right. and not all of it is great. Uh, you have a nice setup here. You have a nice look. You put put obviously a lot of thought into it. Uh, our school, the Magic and Mystery School, is doing a course called Performing Magic Online. And it's a three, three lesson course. Right. And one is how to set up your studio very inexpensively. The second one is the what material works. Right. What material works, not, uh, we call it no touch magic and uh, interactive magic. And the third episode is marketing it. How do you get the word out to your marketplace? There's a lot of competition in the space. So you have to have high quality. You have to have good content and good marketing in order to reach the new audience. The good news is that, um, you know, everybody has an opportunity now to capture a share of the market if they produce quality content. If, if their magic is good, if their magic is real magic, it will get respect. You know, if it's CGI magic, it won't get respect. It might get, you know, views, but it's not going to get respect. And the people that are great um, engaging talk show hosts mm -hmm. and actually good magicians and know how to play with this new medium, you know, and to try innovating things to be able to stave off the icy cold hand of Corona. Oh, no, back, 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 COVID-19, back. By the power of light, I command you. Oh! No. So here we have this interesting proscenium frame now and other creative camera views that we can use. Mm -hmm. And we can do some pre recorded stuff and create these interesting program that breaks outside of this box. Right. But this is the proscenium theater. I mean, it used to be you'd be on a big stage, but now we're here. This is our stage. And we can we can take advantage of certain opportunities of magicians, you know, using this format. I know you have some lay audiences here, so I'm not going to go into the techniques that magicians can use. However, I think for performers and people that are thinking about doing this, you have to think of it as a conversation, not as a show production. I'm not doing show a magic at you. I'm doing magic with you, and you're going to get about as much applause as you do in a casual conversation, which is none which is okay. You're not, you're not trying, you're trying to make more of a connection, a magic connection. I think that's a brand you're exploring. You're trying to make a magic connection with people instead of uh, impressing them. You're expressing, you're expressing, but not impressing them. And I think there's a big difference there. It's more conversational. Right. Now, Eugene Berger, who was my teacher at the mystery school for, for 30 years, I studied with him. He said that, you know, that one of the powers, one of the powers is that you can get to know people's names. And if you're in a gallery view or even in a working a, a chat room on the side, you can see people's names and give them shout outs right. and, and connect with them and actually have conversations with them, depending on the platform you're broadcasting with. So you have the names of every single person. That's something that you don't have at a real close-up show is that name right there. So you can say, Alan, I want you to think of a color. Great. You said red. Uh, Jenny, uh, Jenny over there, he said red. Hearts or diamonds? Right. She says diamonds. Okay. And over here, Andrew, there are court cards and face cards. What do you want? And now you're doing the invisible deck, but with many different pe people on stage. So that's a lot of the material that works because we've been working online magic uh, for for over nine years. Right. So it's a very intimate form. And I'll give you some demonstrations later. But I mean, things things work in a virtual space mm -hmm. that would never 
really work in a, in a um, like one of Eugene's favorite, one of Eugene's favorite card tricks is the, this. He would say, the Ace of Diamonds, the world's fastest card trick. Right. And that works, I think, perfectly fine. You know, these kind of changes and slights work perfectly fine in an in, in a intimate medium. But, but let's, let's get, get your, your viewers, viewers that, that are here. here. Let's, let's take, take them to Las Vegas, Vegas and, and show, show them the, the magic, magic of mystery, mystery school. school. I sent you a little tour. Hi, welcome. My name is Jeff McBride and... I'm Abigail. And welcome to the McBride House of Mystery. Come right in. I've been a professional uh, stage magician. I started magic 50 years ago, and I moved to Las Vegas to be the opening act for Dinah Ross at Caesars Palace. And then I bought this home about a little bit over 20 years ago. And 20 years ago, I moved in to help them, him make the house a home. Let us uh, give you a little initiation into the McBride House of Mystery, right this way. This house is filled with magic and masks and artifacts from all over the world. It's a regular cabinet of curiosities. A lot of magicians have, well, white tigers in Vegas, not us. No, we have dragons. Our dragons are from mainland China, and they were a gift to us from master illusionist Franz Harari, who brought them back from China and just had to make space in his warehouse. So we were fortunate enough to have a pair of dragons to protect our home. studio it's our movement space where I practice my belly dance and we also work with students from all over the world we'll say abracadabra and watch for something magical abracadabra welcome to the inner sanctum at the house of mystery come in Abigail this is one of the largest magic libraries in the world. There are thousands and thousands of books in here on just about every subject. And thousands of students study our books from all over the world. They come here and we ignite their mind with magic. Jeff has been winning awards for the last 20 years that I've been here and beyond. Most recently, he was on Fool Us with Penn and Teller, where he was one of the very few magicians who actually fooled Penn and Teller. And just last week, Jeff was in London, where he was given the David Devant Award, magic's highest honor from the Magic Circle in London. <laughs> Uh, back to the Mystery School, can you tell us a little bit more about the Mystery School? Well, the Mystery School started over 30 years ago as a place for me to train with the brightest philosophers and thinkers in magic. So we had Eugene Berger, we had Max Maven, we had Charles Reynolds, Orman McGill, some of the deep philosophers of magic, Stephen Minch, Peter Samuelson, and they would come and be our special guest and we could learn from them. And we didn't do it in a typical hotel. We did it in a retreat center, far away from the city, in a very calm environment. And it was a place where we could really explore deeply the art and the history and the theory and presentation, the uh, philosophy of magic, the psychology of magic. 
the right. anthropology of magic, all the things other than the eye candy, the things that make ma make tricks into magic. And so it was my way of getting to hang out with these people and I invited my friends. And then over the years, the students that came told us what they want and we started running master classes, real master classes, not just online things that are videos. A real master class is a performer brings their material and they put it in front of the master teachers and then the teachers give them feedback and help them. Right. It's an interactive one-on-one -on -one process, a master class that is then witnessed by a group of people and they can learn and be inspired and illuminated by the uh, feedback and the critique and the helpful uh, encouragement and new ideas that are brought to the student by the teachers. So we hold the master classes and then we realize that people wanted um, uh, training in character development, presentation, script writing, in, in technique as well, in magic theory. So we have all of these different courses in magic that meet different magicians' needs. I just did a, a three-week online class on the classics of parlor magic, mm -hmm. teaching the classics and how we can adapt them for modern presenters. Right. Classics of magic, you need to learn the classics of magic because they've stood the test of time. They are robust, they don't break down. They can be done in any conditions and you can add your personality to them. So over the three weeks, we taught online all of the great classics of magic. And then my next course is Magic Summer School, which is moving from close up to platform to stage, using your close up skills to then get bigger and bigger shows. Also, we're adapting to the time, so we're teaching people how to do Zoom shows. Right. And I spoke about that earlier on. And we have street magic classes. We have magic and medicine for doctors. Uh, we have Sisters of Mystery for women in magic. We have focus on manipulation, where we just spend time working on manipulation with balls, coins, cards, anything that we can, uh, anything that we, anything that we can hold in our hand is what we're working on. Coins, cards, balls, thimbles. So we have different uh, uh, courses depending on the students' needs. And now it's easier than ever for people to attend our classes because we're so making all of these new connections. We're making all of these great new connections. Right. So so speaking about classics in magic, like how do you deal with people that, you know, I mean like magicians, especially because in Asia, um, Floating table is a very common thing that almost every magician would do a floating table. You know, how would, how would you overcome the, the, the thought that, you know, the, the lay audience has probably seen it before? Or maybe, for instance, the linking rings, you know, uh, you know, people would expect there is like, you know, uh, you know. Well, okay, okay, let, 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 let's, let, let's talk about first the table. Where does the table come from? What's the origin of the table? I talked to Levent, who's a brilliant mind in magic, and he says, and, he, and it's very true, researchers go back in time to track it back to its original source. And if the Losander table goes back, you go all the way back, and it's Joe Carson's zombie ball. That's what's going on. That's the modus operandi of that. And if you study the zombie ball, you can make it look new in your own. You see, this is why. If you learn the classic of magic, and I was teaching it yesterday, the zombie and the history of the zombie, and I bet you there's not one viewer other than a viewer that came to my class that can tell me why it's called zombie. I'm gonna ask that question to your, to your viewers. Why is the zombie ball, the zombie floating ball, this floating ball, whoa! Why is this ball called the zombie floating ball? Why? Okay? And uh, I, will, I will send a... a, a um, McBride download to anybody that can answer this question because wow. you can't Google it. <laughs> you can't Google it. Hey, you can't Google it. So you can just stop right now trying to Google it because it don't exist, right? Oh, people probably go to Magic Cafe, Zombie Ball, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Yeah, that's not thinking. That's not knowing. That's just doing research. So let's go back to your original question, the uh, floating table. Mm -hmm. Many people that started in magic, started learning with the zombie ball. And many people have made their reputation by making it their signature. Lance Burton and Johnny Thompson came up with that floating cage instead of a zombie ball. Right. Norm Nielsen floated a violin, became his signature. And they didn't sell it. 
Um, oh. I, if you look up Jeff McBride floating mask, you'll find my floating mask, which was inspired by people like Marvin Roy, Mr. Electric doing zombie with a light bulb. I had a theme act mask, so a floating mask. Uh, zombie is a very practical uh, sort of flotation because you can do the zombie in almost any conditions. So I did it with a mask. Other people did it with different objects. Pierre Brahma, who won FISM twice, did it with a floating crown. Wow. You know, many people have made it their own. And Losander made, made the table, but he decided to market it. But if people go back to the original, if they read and go back instead of looking forward, they'll come up, they'll see what magicians have done to personalize it and make it their own. The same thing with the linking rings. The linking rings is one of the classics of magic. How do you make it your own? It's about the story, the narrative. Mm -hmm. It's about right. connection. It's about the things that are separate in life that can be joined. Right. And who's separate? All separate. But now we're being connected. And we're being connected because of challenging times. So the, 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 the symbolism and metaphor of the linking rings is those things that are separate can come together. They can be joined in relationship, in love, friendship, and community. But that's what most people miss. They miss the the, the archetypal metaphor of the, the magic illusion, and they just go for the trick. It's about joining together. That's why the linking finger rings is about joining together. You know, the linking finger rings is a very right. beautiful trick because it talks of, you know, two people joining, like in wedding, you know, like in a, in a wedding, in a marriage. So sometimes you have to study the symbolism of magic and the metaphor of magic instead of just the eye candy of magic. There's right. a lot of literature on this, but it's buried in books. And most people today go, I'm a visual learner. Well, they're only going to get that much information from the last you know, 20 years of video. They're not going to get this rich history of magic that spans hundreds and hundreds of years. So if you want to invent new tricks, you got to read old books. Good point. I, I do agree with you on that, definitely. So, I mean, like, tell us about the other magicians you worked with at the Mystery School. Like, what was the biggest illusion ever, you know? Well, at the Mystery School, we get a lot of great teachers and even, you know, we people that have been guest teachers here at the Mystery School. Uh, like the, the big illusionists, the big names. David Copperfield has come here and spoke to the students. Teller, um, of course, uh, people that maybe you, some of your uh, viewers wouldn't know, like Billy McComb was great master. The, the Pendragons have been here. Uh, Johnny Thompson, Channing Pollock, wow. Lance Burton, Mac King have all come to the school and have helped our students. And Mac King and uh, Lance Burton being the ones that come back again and again and again to help us. Um, so that is, those are some of our great allies that are very interested in sharing their magic. Uh, also, I must say on a side note that if there are young magicians out there, Lance Burton is holding a free two-day seminar uh, this summer in July for teen magicians, and it's free. So you might want to look to the IBM, the International Brotherhood of Magicians site for the Lance Burton Teen Seminar, because that's another way we give back to the world of magic is by hosting a free seminar. And last year we had Joshua Jay and Andy Gladwin and Sean Farquhar and Ice McDonald and Larry Haas, the Dean of the Magic and Mystery School and many others giving teaching not only good magic, you know, effects and routines, but also the thinking and the, the life skills that go along with magic, confidence, self-esteem, public speaking skills, um, right. critical thinking skills, problem solving mm -hmm. skills. A lot goes into magic. It's more than just tricks. Right, definitely agree with you there. So someone have a question over here. It's just like, how do you deal with big shows, especially in Vegas? How do I deal with big shows? Yeah. The key to doing big shows is doing thousands of little shows. And that means doing a little bit of magic every day, social magic. I wrote a, a book years ago called Magician 24-7. It's on my website. And it talks about how to uh, use magic in daily practice out in the world, not necessarily doing street magic, but doing a little bit of magic in social situations to build up your confidence, to build up your um, repertoire, to build up your ability to handle challenging situations. If you only do a magic show once a week, what happens is all the adrenaline, and adrenaline is just a, a powerful, powerful chemical in our body. 
If you only do one show a week, that comes, the adrenaline comes out and you demonize it, you call it nervousness, where it's energy, it's energy. Right. And if you do a little bit of magic every day, you learn how to regulate the adrenal gland and learn how to work with it. So when those big shows come up, you're ready for it, it's training. Like if, if you're trying to be, be a, a power lifter or something, you have to train, you have to train. And if you're gonna do big shows, you have to train every day every day it's not just doing thinking about it and doing the show you have to get out there and do shows every day and that show could be for one person it could be for the mailman it could be the per the person in the store that's uh, packing your groceries but you have to do a little bit of magic every day to be able to and if you, if you can get into a situation where you're doing shows every day whether it's street shows, whether you're working at a theme park, whether you're hustling birthday gigs. I mean, and and if you do birthdays, family shows, if you do family shows, not kids shows, if you do family shows, always try to perform your best show. Because right. Lance, at, this is Lance's story. And I, you know, I talk about this all the time. It's a great teaching story. When Lance was back in Louisville, Kentucky, and now Lance is a retired millionaire. But before he was a retired millionaire, he was working on his act, candles, doves, cards, 12 minutes. That's what he was gonna do. And if he got a five or $20 birthday show, he would bring the tuxedo, bring the birds, bring a backdrop, bring all the candles and go in and show up at the house an hour before, have all the kids go in another room. He would put up the backdrop, hide the birds, fill up the candles, get all the cards and all the, the silks ready, and then all the, the, the kids show stuff. And he would put on his music on a cassette machine, you know, a little cassette years, you know, it's the 70s. And he would go out and in his mind, he was on the great stages that we imagined when we were a kid, even though he was in a living room performing for 15, eight year olds, in his mind, he was on the big stage. Right. Did he have to deliver that show? No, they would have been happy with, you know, turn it around or, you know, needle through balloon or whatever that people were doing back in the 70s for birthday party shows. But he needed the practice and I was doing the same thing. I would always do my best show. I would always, no matter where it was, I wouldn't just do a, sh a like bring a suitcase. Right. And open the suitcase and do cut and restored rope and balls over the head. No, I would like bring the doves and bring the cages and bring the whole thing and do my dream show. And it took a lot of work, but guess what? The people that put in the work got the big gigs and made millions of dollars. The people that are dragging a little suitcase because that's enough show for the party aren't gonna get there. Cause you asked a very good question. When a trick is overdone, what do you do? <clears throat> you gotta trace it back to, its, back to its original source and find out what was really going on back then. You know what, one of the tricks that we taught in the classics of magic, the egg bag. Everybody does either Johnny Thompson's egg bag or Jeff Hobson's egg bag. Mm -hmm. Or a variation of Charlie Miller, which is the Max Malini, Charlie Miller, Johnny Thompson version. But if you go back and you study it where it first began, like Isaac Fox at the Bartholomew Fair, you know, back in the 1700s, the, 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 the egg bag was a prelude to a chicken production or multiple bird production. And people like Deladelphia, the cowboy magician, you know, <clears throat> back in the vaudeville age, Mike Cavity wrote a wonderful article. He produced like 17 eggs and two chickens from the bag. So people forgot that it was a prelude to a much larger production, but they didn't want to carry around the chickens or the 17 eggs. So the routine shrank into this little thing that you could put in your suitcase because it was easy. And sometimes great magic isn't easy. What is your biggest reaction for the least amount of effect? Okay, that is one of my favorite questions. What gets the biggest reaction for the least amount of effort? And I say it's my version of Pavel's Knots Off Silk, which I call mm -hmm. Bekos, B-E-K-O-S. And you can see it on my website. It takes absolutely no effort and it gets a huge reaction in the show. Wow, I, I need mean, to try it. It's, it yeah, it's a great, great trick. It's a great, great trick. The story of the zombie. Now, if you read the book, uh, Beyond Zombie by Joe Carson, uh, Joe Carson has a very interesting um, way he developed the zombie ball. And maybe some of the readers know that. 
But the story, the mythology, the story behind it is in Haiti, the witch doctors, they make a special brew. And when they give it to their enemy or somebody they want to control, when they drink this brew, they, the, the, the narcotics in the brew that they put in this kind of witch doctor brew, put them in a catatonic state of sleep. They're not dead. And then the witch doctor can steal their soul and they take their soul and they place the soul into a silver ball that sits upon the witch doctor's altar. And now that it is upon their altar, if a person was to touch the ball, they would kill the soul in the ball. So the ball, in order to be manipulated or moved, can only be handled by cloth. And now that's the reason for the cloth. And that's the story of zombie, which you will find on the internet nowhere. And that's why it's important to study with people that are older and have more stories and more history. One of the biggest challenges with magic is most people learn peer to peer instead of study with a master. I studied with a master for over 30 years and studied with some of the greatest names in magic. I understand the, the, the power and the legacy of top-down lineage teaching from master to student to student. And as Eugene said, the secrets of magic, here's my Eugene altar right here. So he's always right there next to me. He said, the real secrets of magic are not on YouTube clips. They're not on DVDs. They're not even in books. The real secrets of magic are handed down from master to student in whispers. Magic teaches us three things. Magic teaches us three big lessons. First lesson is our reality is subject to change without notice. That all of a sudden in a flash, boom, reality changes. In two months, reality changes, boom. We didn't see it coming. It's now you see it, now you don't. And that's what magic reminds us. It also reminds us that um, we're living in an age where it, we have to be okay not knowing the answer. Right. And when we watch magic, you can either struggle trying to figure out how it's done, or you can just rely on, I surrender. I surrender to the of not knowing, and that's okay. Because right now, not knowing is okay. Because no one knows. And magic reminds us that you don't have to have all the answers. And magicians run into this all the time when they get those analytical audiences going, oh, I hate this, I can't figure it out, how's it doing, give me that, I gotta see that, uh, uh, uh. Figure it out, I'll watch it 20 times and I'm gonna figure it out and I'm gonna put hateful comments on the YouTube because I figured out where the where the where the gimmick was, right? And you could just go crazy trying to figure <clears throat> out how the world works. So you don't have to know. Reality changes, and the third thing magic reminds us is that we are living in a capital M mystery. We are living in a mystery, and mysteries aren't here to be figured out or solved. Mysteries are here to be experienced. Our world has changed. We don't have the answer. We're living in a mystery. And we might as well just surrender to the mystery for right now and do the best we can with the tools we got. And if you have a deck of cards and if you have a webcam, you can connect to the world. You're making a magical connection with Andrew Lee. Thank you so much, Jeff. So I mean, one last question for me, since like no one's asking questions, but you know, what do you need? What do you think that magicians need to do during these uh, challenging times? Um, you know, with the virus that's going on at the moment. Well, they need to connect to each other. They need to connect to themselves and study and practice. They need to connect to the past and learn their history of magic instead of just what's on TikTok. If they're just living in, in in the little TikTok, they don't have the bigger history of magic. And if they study and train and learn the history of magic, they'll be able to create new things for their Instagram and TikTok. <laughs>
But don't forget that there is live performance too. That at the end of the day, if you get a thousand or a million followers or two million followers, someone's going to want you to do a live show. And that's where you're wow. going to need training. So awesome. come to the Magic and Mystery School. <laughs> yeah, I will see you there again very soon, Jeff. Well, this was fantastic. And hopefully you'll put this up and you can share this with all of the other uh, magicians. And you can put this up. And, and also, this is a show that can be shared with anybody because we don't give any uh, secrets away, do we? Nope, we don't. And no, we they don't. know where to That's learn good. magic That's now, so yeah. Opens up your, opens up your viewership. Yes. Well, I'm going to say uh, goodbye and I'll leave you with this little piece of magic. Magic reminds us that our world is subject to change, that we don't need to know the answer and that we're living in a mystery. And that's the message from my heart. Stay connected and stay magical. I'm Jeff McBride from Las Vegas. I'll see you next time. Thank you so much, Jeff. I hope you guys are enjoying yourself. I hope this was insightful for you as much as it is for me. Um, if you guys like this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and we'll see you guys in the next one.